Hello and welcome to Misquoted on Movies. In this video, we're going to take a deep dive into the long take. Everything you wanted to know, but were afraid to ask. You want to play the tape? Huh? We're going to go back to the origins and the history of the long take, its evolution over the years, the techniques, the tricks, and why filmmakers absolutely love the challenge. We'll celebrate the most famous long takes and what made them great and also highlight some of the more unknown and underrated long takes that you might not know about. So sit back, relax, and let's remove the mask of the long take. So a huge part of the magic of movies is the way they handle time, or should I say, the way they cheat it. Anachronous movies jump around a lot in time. They're non-linear. So I think Pulp Fiction, the way the stories all intertwine. Memento is another perfect example where it's largely told through flashbacks. Ellipsis, this is where we see an incident, act or event, and then jump forward in time. We, the audience, are left to fill in the gaps. Fast and slow motion. This scene here in X-Men Days of Future Past perfectly demonstrates that. The transition between ultra slow motion bullet time if you like and then speeding back up again that's that's really that's technical talk that doesn't really concern so these are all examples of how time can be bent manipulated and implied for the purpose of story okay so let's go back and have a look at the history of the long take hitchcock used the technique in his 1948 movie rope the whole movie is presented as a single fluid take except it uses hidden cuts Rolls of film at the time were the limiting factor and the most you could shoot in a single take was around 10 minutes. The cuts worked fine, but you don't need to be a genius to spot them. They look crude now. A year later, Orson Welles raised the bar in this technique with his movie Citizen Kane. Welles used camera and editing tricks to show fluid one-take movements through scenes. This use of clever visual effects to fool the audience into thinking the shot was continuous would go on to inspire many future generations of filmmaker. Here we can see clear influence in David Fincher's Panic Room. We'll come back to this technique later where you use visual effects to fake a long take. So anyway, back to Wells. He used the technique again in 58 in his movie, Touch of Evil. Much celebrated in so many film school circles, it's undeniably a classic, but for me, it's a burdened and a troubled one. I'm not going to go into detail today, that's planned for a future video, but a good example is a difference between the two versions of the film. Okay, so bottom right, you can see the studio release. It has a totally different soundtrack, aspect ratio, and it also includes movie credits in vision. The reconstructed version, however, focuses totally on the action. There's no music apart from what's happening in the scene, and no credits. This puts the long take front and centre. It's pure. The scene took an entire night to shoot, mainly because the actor playing the customs officer kept blowing his lines. The last take is what made it into the final cut of the film. And you can see in the background, the sun is clearly coming up. So, it would be another 34 years before anyone would follow in Hitchcock's footsteps. The next time someone took on a single tank movie was 1982. Shot for TV, Bella Tars Macbeth has a pre credit scene and then runs a fluid 57 minutes, all shot on video. Clearly now it looks very dated, but the shot construction and the blocking was a glimpse at the talent of the film student Tar. He went on to be a great filmmaker. He then mentored his assistant, Laszlo Nemes, who then in turn went on to direct well, Son of Soul. Thanks to the Academy for this incredible honor. So, okay, the cuts aren't hidden in this film, but there's a reason why I wanted to highlight it. Here the director has used the technique to really put us in the shoes of our main character. We're following along with him on his journey. Telling the story as if it's real time really makes for an intense movie experience. And you can see the frame here is cropped to this 4x3 shape. Makes everything feel really claustrophobic and crowded. A technique which has been recently used by Robert Eggers in the film The Lighthouse, which I really enjoyed. 
So now that we're on the intensity theme, let's start exploring that. This scene from Hard Bob was massively celebrated at the time. It looks so ridiculous and dated now. Look, he shoots at this door and it explodes. I like the more contemporary take in Old Boy. Unrelenting in this wide, almost theatre-like shot, it reminds me of Wes Anderson's work. This is the opening scene from Catherine Bigelow's Strange Days. The movie was a flop, but this scene was really ambitious. No camera existed that could shoot the scene. With help from James Cameron, her husband at the time, a heavily modified 35mm camera was developed. It must have been a logistical nightmare. Cuts are hidden, so the long take is faked, but it was truly groundbreaking at the time. Utia is a harrowing single take account based on the attack of the children's camp in Sweden back in 2011. It's a great example where the story's intensity and drama can really take the audience on a journey. Cinematographer Martin Oberbach won many awards for this movie. Making it a real-time single take places you in the carnage alongside the students. So the goal was to shoot the movie in one fluid take. Director Eric Poppe and his cast and crew would only have one chance per day to get the full run because of the complexity of the shoot. And on the fourth and final day, they nailed it. This is the take that you see in the movie. So this is one of my favourite, favourite scenes from recent years. Director David Leach, for me, is just so talented at making action movies. We follow these two characters take refuge in a building and then Charlize Theron's character fights her way out. It feels like real time, but there are, of course, hidden cuts. I'll show you, like, here. and here. Also, you'll notice that there is no music in the scene when you watch the movie. It really, really feels intense. Okay, let's put all the action and intensity to one side for a minute. Let's have a look at how the technique can be used in other ways. Here's a scene from Robert Altman's The Player. All the major characters are introduced in one single slick take, sweeping and weaving through a studio lot. The techniques used again here in Joss Whedon's Serenity. The opening scene reintroduces all the main characters from the TV show and it also gives you a scale of the ship. Here we see Paul Thomas Anderson's opening scene to Boogie Nights. It really sets the tone for the movie and informs you about the time in which it's set. Now he used this technique all the way back in one of his first movies, Hard Eight. And I want to compare this to one of the most famous long take scenes from Goodfellas. I know I'd go from rags to riches. Thank you, sir. All right, see you later. Thanks. What are you doing? So I've quite unfairly put the two scenes side by side, and that's really just to show that the action is so similar. Top left, we follow professional gambler Sydney into a casino. Bottom right, we have Henry and Karen on their date to the Copacabana nightclub. Now they're both steady cam shots, but the Goodfellas scene is so much richer. It's full of interactions and the blocking is amazing. Henry's coolness and charisma are at their height. It's slick and dizzying. And like Karen, we're being seduced into the mobster world. The movement of the camera is not anywhere near as impactful as the world that Scorsese is selling us. Every time you do. While researching this video, I saw a few stories claiming that this was a compromise. They couldn't shoot going through the front door, so they had to use the service entrance. I think that's just talk. I don't see Scorsese compromising on his vision. I think it's so famous because it's such a great scene in an already great movie. Next, we're going to focus on the work of one man, cinematographer Emmanuel Lebeski, aka Chivo. Specifically, I want to talk about his work with Alfonso Cuaron and Alejandro Inaritu. In Children and Men, the long take is used to absolute perfection, really, really putting you in the scene. This being one of the most famous scenes, and they actually put a camera in the car and remote controlled. What you see is a stitched together scene. There are fake cuts in here. The director and cinematographer would again visit this technique in gravity. The opening scene is, of course, breathtaking. It's the perfect marriage of filmmaking and visual effects. And it should be. Well, I've got good news and bad news. Gravity was more expensive than the real Indian Mars orbit mission. The budget of Gravity was 100 million US dollars. 
versus 74 million US dollars for the mission. And fun fact, Robert Downey Jr. was originally slated to play George Clooney's character. Terrific. Next up, Birdman. Hollywood's love letter to the theatre industry. Now, while I really enjoyed this film, it was quite divisive. Most of my friends that watched it hated it. Now, Michael Keaton was brilliant. He genuinely deserved his Oscar. It sometimes felt a little bit like style over substance. The director and cinematographer's work together on The Revenant, however, I think worked far better. The action scenes really, really deliver, placing you in that scene like we spoke about before. However, this scene really shows where the technique doesn't actually work. Instead of being placed in Hugh Glass's shoes, you're taken out of the scene. This camera movement here makes you suddenly aware of the camera operator. And you can almost picture the behind the scenes. It's a strange decision, but who am I to argue with a great director? So this leads us now into the movies whose long takes don't quite achieve greatness. Now Joe Wright's Atonement's beach scene is of course a technical masterclass. A thousand extras and a tiny window of time to get the single take right. Now they had two days to get this shot right and from the height of the sun here we can guess that they maybe have one more chance on this shooting day. And it was the third take that actually made the final movie. There's so much going on here. However, I did spot this nearly trip from Nonso and Ozzy. It flows beautifully, but for me, it's let down by the end of the shot where it just feels like all the extras are just waiting to hear cut. They all seem so static and rooted to their spots. I don't know, maybe I'm being harsh. Hit the comments and give me your opinions. 1917 was hotly tipped to win big at the Oscars, but eventually lost out to Parasite. Now I'm gonna use stills here as I don't want a copyright strike. For me, it's a fine film, but I am not convinced the single take was particularly necessary to tell this story. So this character here is played by Andrew Scott. He's a fine actor. Uh, this is not a criticism of him or what he does or how he does it. But the camera work here lets his performance down. He feels a little bit over the top at times, maybe even rushing his dialogue. His reactions to our leads just doesn't sit right. And this is something I think could have been fixed in the edit if we were cutting to different angles. You have a chance to just space things out or get the timing right. So much work is done in the edit suite. And exactly as we showed in the scene in The Revenant earlier, you don't need to see certain things. So the long take and the fake long take are everywhere to be seen in cinema. From the bombastic, like this superbly slick scene in Kingsman, to art house cinema like Tarkovsky's final masterpiece, The Sacrifice. Spielberg is a master in both the subtle long take and the action long take. But it's this point that we shift our attention to movies that are one single continuous long take. That's yeah. ambitious. No hidden cuts, no hidden tricks. Russian Ark is an example of super high concept filmmaking. It's where pure showboating meets cultural and historical celebration. It's part drama, part documentary, and all shot in the Russian State Heritage Museum. We are walked through three centuries of history, performed by a cast of 2,000. It's bewilderingly complex, and you'd get a headache just trying to think of the best way to approach it logistically, let alone creatively. You'll of course recognise Woody Harrelson here. Hi Woody. Hi. Lost in London was Harrelson's directorial debut. Based on a rather infamous drunken night he had in London. The story is somewhat a passenger to the concept, but its place in this examination of the single take is a must. It's a brilliant technical and logistical achievement. Now we're on the subject of ambition, I bring you Time Code. Sadly, it looks fairly dated now, having been shot on DV back in 2000. Mike Figgist used four different cameras to run simultaneously, in real time, side by side in quadrants. Using the audio mix, he would shift the viewer's attention between cameras. Sometimes the camera action intertwining. Massively ambitious, but he does pull it off. The plot is viewed as a little melodramatic by some, and the improvisation that was often demanded could leave some a bit cold. But technically it was a fantastic achievement and true innovation in filmmaking. 
movie which you may not have heard of, but is certainly one of the more ambitious one take movies, is Victoria. And fun fact, this is Sebastian here playing a role in the 1996 movie, The English Patient. Now, unlike 1917, this movie is one real fluid camera movement. There's no fakery. We follow Victoria from clubs, to the Berlin streets, to cafes, to apartments, to bank heists. Initially, the movie was shot in 10 minute segments. This really served as a rehearsal, but it also meant should they fail in their one fluid take attempt, the movie could be pieced together. Over the last four nights of production, the movie was attempted as one long running piece. Dialogue was mostly improvised as the director didn't want the cast bogged down and tied too tightly to a script. The first take, Shipper said, was just fine, but because everyone was on edge, it came across in the performance. He craved the chaos and the confusion. He said they found that in the second take, but it just didn't work. They had to use jump cuts to cover the mistakes and it didn't look good. The take we see in the actual movie was shot in real time between 4.30 a.m. and 7 a.m. on a brisk Berlin morning back in April 2014. It's high stakes filmmaking that had they not pulled off in a single take, they would have completely lost its magic. And rightly so, the director ensured that his DP was given top billing in the credits. And I'm sorry, brother, I'm not even going to attempt to say that name. Wow, so what began as what I thought would be a short little video highlighting all of my favorite one take movies and scenes. It just grew arms and legs and became a bit of a beast. There are, of course, movies I've left out, but I feel like I've given you a really rounded view and a deep dive of what the long take is all about. So hit the comments with any thoughts and opinions you have on the long take. Who do you like? Be sure to like and share the clip where appropriate. And of course, subscribe for more content. Now, at the time of making this film here in the UK, we're in lockdown due to the COVID-19 pandemic. This means I have a lot more time on my hands, so if there's topics that you would like to see covered in my videos, you don't know what I can do. please get in touch via the comments or on my Instagram, where we have a lot of fun with movie quotes. We mix them up and it's all very silly, but come along and check it out. Let's get the hell out of here.